If you're considering a Princess Cruise from Japan, I hope you find this video helpful. Prior to embarking the Diamond Princess for an eight-night cruise around Japan, we spent four nights in wonderful Yokohama. Not only was it an ideal base for our daily bullet train excursions to Kyoto and Hiroshima, the Tokyo adjacent city of 3.8 million was a safe, friendly, and beautiful place to explore. Yokohama has a 2.5 mile long waterfront promenade lined with, thanks to the current exchange rate, affordable hotels and numerous attractions within walking distance, ranging from European style colonial buildings, a cup noodles museum, an excellent dining and shopping, to Japan's largest Chinatown. Even the cruise terminal itself is an attraction, with its wooden promenades that provide beautiful views of the harbor and its surrounds, not to mention a fine model of the Normandy. And speaking of views, for 900 yen or about $6, you can visit the 348-foot tall marine tower overlooking my favorite attraction in all of Japan, the preserved 1930-built ocean liner, Hikawa Maru. Hikawa Maru's original Art Deco interiors are now considered a cultural treasure, and her history is fascinating. You can find much more about this ship on this channel. Now let's head back to the passenger terminal, where our home for the next eight nights, the Diamond Princess, awaits. I'll save the full deck top to bottom history and tour for another video, but here's a quick overview. Diamond Princess was actually laid down as the Sapphire Princess at Mitsubishi's Nagasaki Shipyard, but due to a fire on the original Diamond Princess, the names were switched while the other ship was being repaired. The largest ships in the popular Grand Class platform, they carry a maximum of 3,100 passengers and can be distinguished from their Italian-built sisters by the aluminum baubles on their funnels. These are merely decorative indicators that these two ships are augmented with gas turbines in addition to their diesels. And yes, like almost every cruise ship, Diamond Princess's passengers and crew were devastated in the early days of the pandemic. But after a major refit in 2022, I'm happy to report that this ship is back and better than ever. So let's start at the very top of the ship on Midship's Deck 18, where an observation platform provides excellent views in all directions. On aft Deck 18, center court is a fenced-in basketball court. Other deck areas include the sanctuary on forward Deck 16, which guests can book for a fee for a half or full day of peace and tranquility. A menu of massage treatments can also be booked here. And just behind the movies under the stars screen, there's a putting course on deck 16. The Grand Class ships boast no less than four pools, including the spa and sanctuary adjacent Lotus Pool. The open-air Neptune's Reef Pool is surrounded in sunning space and features a giant Movies Under the Stars LED screen, while the Calypso Pool is housed under a two-story glass and metal dome. And at the very stern of the Diamond Princess, the aptly named Terrace Pool is one of the ship's best-kept secrets. And unlike their newer fleet mates, the Grand Class ships have a fully encircling promenade on decks 8 and 7. Now let's talk dining. Diamond Princess has no less than five main dining rooms, all with the same menus, but with different decorative themes. Four, including the Santa Fe, Pacific Moon, Vivaldi, and Savoy, are adjacent to the midship's Grand Plaza atrium and seat approximately 250 guests. All of these main dining rooms offer included in the fair open seating dinner, 
and reservations can be made using the Medallion app. On aft deck 6, the international dining room spans the width of the ship and seats 500 guests. Depending on port schedules, it's usually open for full-service breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as well as an afternoon tea that is served at 3 p.m. daily. In addition to the poolside Prego's Pizzeria and the Trident Grill with mainly burger fare, the World Fresh Market, or Horizon Court on deck 14, offers an outstanding buffet with gorgeous sea views. The seafood is especially good here. There's a Caesar salad station, various veggie selections, a regular salad bar, cold and hot appetizers, pasta, and an excellent variety of main courses, including sushi and a selection of Japanese and Western favorites. Now let's have a look at Diamond Princess's public spaces. Skywalkers tops them all from its perch on aft deck 17. This outer space meets disco themed bar also has some of the best views at sea. On aft deck 15, the treehouse has activities for kids aged 3 to 12 and the lodge caters to teens. Meanwhile, on forward deck 15, the Lotus Spa surrounds the Lotus Pool area and has separate dressing rooms for men and women. For guests booking a treatment, there's a relaxation room and a thermal suite with various wet and steam options. There's also a spectrum of treatment rooms for couples and singles alike. Near the entrance off the starboard side, there's a beauty salon and just beyond that, a state-of-the-art gym which is free for all guests. Exclusive in the Princess Fleet to the Diamond Princess, is the Japanese-themed Izumi Baths on aft deck 15. The Izumi Baths also have an outdoor deck with a private whirlpool. Spanning two levels on forward deck 6 and 7, the Princess Theater is the main showroom. It has excellent, pillar-free sight lines and is the largest public room on the ship. Tucked away off the Deck 6 entrance to the theater is Churchill's Cigar Lounge and Bar with its interesting ceiling. On the port side of Deck 6 next to Churchill's is the Hearts and Minds Wedding Chapel. The Grand Casino continues aft from there to the Grand Plaza Atrium. Continuing aft of the theater on Deck 7, the Wheelhouse Bar has memorabilia from Princess Cruz's former parent company P&O Lines. The three-deck tall Grand Plaza Atrium is both physically and functionally the heart of the ship. This is where most guests enter for the first time and this is where guest services, shore excursions and most of the shops are located. Numerous events and celebrations take place here and the bottom deck 5 level is a great setting for live music performances. On the port side of the Deck 5 level, Good Spirits is a specialty coffee go-to and bar. And on the corresponding starboard side, there's a dedicated library, as well as an internet cafe. And while we're on Deck 5, the Fine Arts Gallery with for sale artworks lines the passage leading forward to the accommodations. Now let's head back up to the starboard side of the Deck 7 level of the Grand Plaza 
where Crooners Bar is a popular people-watching hub night and day. The Explorer's Lounge and Bar is a cabaret-style showroom directly aft of the Grand Plaza on Deck 7. Exclusive to Diamond Princess and the new Sunclass ships is Kai Sushi, an a la carte price specialty restaurant which is located on Deck 7. Sabatini's, the popular extra tariff Italian trattoria, is just aft of Kai Sushi on Deck 7. The two aforementioned specialty restaurants are accessed on starboard Deck 7 via the Princess Photo Gallery. Club Fusion, a mid-sized single-level showroom and sports bar, occupies the aft portion of Deck 7. A spiral staircase in Club Fusion that's reminiscent of the original stairs in QE2's double room leads down to the secluded, speakeasy-like Wakeview Bar. Now let's have a look at some of Diamond Princess's accommodations, beginning with the most sumptuous, the Grand Suite on Aft Baja Deck, with a private dining room, a huge living room, separate bedroom, and a sprawling teak-lined balcony half the width of the ship, overlooking the wake. Only slightly less opulent are 27 330 square foot balcony suites with a sitting area and separate bedroom. There are also 186 275 square foot mini suites and no less than 522 170 square foot balcony cabins like ours, B705 on aft starboard Baja deck. There are 236 ocean view staterooms in various sizes with a picture window and 379 interiors, which of course are the most affordable. Diamond Princess also has several categories of wheelchair accessible staterooms. The embarkation process in Yokohama was quick and easy, taking a mere 20 minutes from check-in to gangway. We spent our first hours on board unpacking, eating, and getting to know the ship before heading up to deck for Diamond Princess's 4 p.m. departure. As we cleared the Yokohama Bay Bridge and entered Tokyo Bay, guests and staff alike partied by the Neptune's Reef pool. Meanwhile, it was a bit more tranquil at the terrace pool. As the sun began to set, we enjoyed a perfectly chilled bottle of bubbly on our balcony, watching as Mount Fuji appeared out of the haze. We took it as a good omen and a perfect start to our cruise. Dinner that first night was in the Churrascaria Brazilian Grill, which is set each night on the starboard side of the Horizon Court. Bring your appetite because all 11 of the meat and poultry items on the menu are served at the table and there's an excellent selection of antipasti at the salad bar, which more than sated my mostly vegetarian palate. As I settled in with my delicious veggies, the waiters brought cheese bread and our side dish orders. Jelly. <laughs> Brazilian. Salsa, chimichurri, mashed potato, garlic, and the mushrooms. And then on my partner Mike's side of the table, the real show began with beef, pork, chicken, and lamb selections, all sizzling hot and freshly sliced off the skewer. Oh, and there was a skewered pineapple that was imported from Darwin. From Darwin? Yes, sir. Australia? Yes. Wow. Thank you. The pork loin. <laughs> and finally, and quite unnecessarily, dessert. We awoke late the next morning and headed straight to Good Spirits for cappuccinos as one of the Explore Japan cultural events 
a kendama challenge, took place in the Grand Plaza. After another cappuccino or two, we decided to explore the ship. Thanks to a mild but persistent rain, the outer decks were empty. Nonetheless, we enjoyed a stroll around the promenade where 2.5 laps equals a mile. Full wraparound sheltered promenades are a lost start on today's ships, one of the reasons I so much enjoy the grand ships. And even in the rain, or perhaps more because of it, the views from Skywalkers were mesmerizing. Please raise your glass to smooth sailing. That evening, there was a captain's welcome aboard celebration, followed with one of Princess's most popular photo ops, the Champagne Waterfall in the Grand Plaza. A perfect table. We enjoyed dinner by a window overlooking the sea in the Santa Fe. I loved having both Japanese and Italian favorites to choose from. After our truly gluttonous experience the prior night, it was actually kind of nice to enjoy a light meal. Yeah, you can. <laughs> Before retiring, we really enjoyed Australian violinist Kate's show in the theater. We were up just in time to watch Diamond Princess pivot into Kagoshima, which is at the tip of Kyushu, the southernmost of Japan's four main islands. After a timely room service breakfast, we beelined straight to Good Spirits to try a green tea cappuccino before heading off on our highlights of Kagoshima excursion. At the cruise terminal, we were greeted warmly by the locals and were soon off on a coach to the ferry terminal where we drove aboard the first ferry for a 20 minute ride to Sakurajima. We loved our guide, Mako, who was charming, polite, and well-informed. And it was fun to head up on deck for a refreshing mini-cruise across the bay as no less than six small ferries made their way back and forth. Because of the active Sakurajima volcano in its bay, Kagoshima is a sister city to Naples, which has the very similar Mount Vesuvius in its bay. Sakurajima's last massive eruption was in 1914, but the volcano remains active, with steam constantly rising from its peak. Okay. So, um, Once on the other side, it was a short drive to the Sakurajima Lava Nagisa Park and foot bath, where we dipped our toes in hot mineral water before driving onwards to the Arimara Lava Observatory for sweeping views of the 3,665-foot volcano and its surrounds. Our timing was perfect as the clouds momentarily parted, revealing the peak, despite rain being forecast that day. All too soon, as the clouds re-enveloped the peak, we were back on another ferry and then off to Iso Gardens. Also known as Sengan-en, these gardens were established in 1658 and on a clear day have sweeping views of Sakurajima. We were welcomed back at the Diamond Princess with a chilled towel Oops, and then I'm headed so up to deck for the sail away. In a genuinely heartwarming gesture, a local band of junior high and high school students serenaded us with big band, jazz and pop tunes as we sailed off. In well over 300 cruises, I have to say that the Japanese hospitality is second to none. That evening, we had the supreme pleasure of the chef's table experience, which started with a welcome glass of champagne and caviar in the Wakeview Bar. Hosted by restaurant director Giuseppe Francina and executive chef Giancarlo Samararo, it included a galley visit before we were led to an elegant table set up in the Pacific Moon. The chef's table costs $95 and is limited to 10 to 12 guests 
and was only offered on two nights during our cruise. So this comes from uh, South Australia. Uh, it's uh, we have One of our table mates, a very happy and frequent princess cruiser, <laughs> told us this was her first chef's table despite signing up for the experience on dozens of prior cruises. So everything is a combination. And a table, of Did you hear that? And don't Did. forget, don't ask how you do home. Yeah. Whatever you don't eat, you need to wash the dish after. <laughs> <laughs> because I'll be come later, the night's still young, eh? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, All right, so every beautiful. important dinner needs the night is not done yet. Oh we have way to go. Well, Princess has always excelled with its dining experiences, but this one is the ultimate. After some two hours of supreme indulgence, the chef's table ended with flowers for the ladies. Somehow after all that, we managed to stumble into the Princess Theater for the second Born to be Wild main stage production show featuring the Diamond Princess's cast. On the fourth day, we were out on the balcony for our arrival in Busan, South Korea. As we pivoted under the Busan Harbor Bridge, the city of 3.8 million seemed to go on forever. I was especially excited as aside from a layover at Incheon Airport, this would be my first visit to Korea. We cleared customs and headed to the coach where even the steps welcomed us for the Best of Busan full day excursion. As with Kagoshima, Busan provided us with a wonderful guide, Sun Un Young, who was so well informed, welcoming and funny. She kept us all together and on time and fully engaged throughout the day. Within minutes of our departure, we were on the roller coaster like ramp leading to the Cable Stay Harbor Bridge and Tunnel Complex to the Heidong Yonggungsa Temple, a Buddhist temple site dating to the 14th century. Well, on second thought, there seems to be some dispute about the temple's 14th century origins but it is nonetheless one of the most popular sites in Busan, provided us with numerous selfie ops, and is in a delightful seaside setting. After lunch, our next stop was the Dombek Siam Island, where we walked through a lush park to the Apex House, which was built in 2005 for the Apex Summit of Pacific Base Nations. From a nearby lookout, there were gorgeous views of Busan Harbor and the Guangan de Gyo, or Diamond Suspension Bridge. We took the more scenic walk back via a smaller bridge, then paused for a view of the famed Hyundai Beach one of the most popular in Korea. Soon we were crossing back over the Diamond and Busan Harbor Bridges on our way to the Jogal Chi'i Fish Market, which was an eye-opening experience. We were given shopping time at a nearby marketplace, then returned to our ship where a dramatic sunset greeted us. As Diamond Princess sailed off into the East China Sea, we enjoyed the first of two wonderful dinners in Sabatini's, the Extra Terra Trattoria. We were exhausted, so I'll just show my soup, the ribolita, which is a Tuscan with tomatoes, cannellini, beans, and kale, and my wonderful eggplant parmesan. There'll be much more about Sabatini's soon. By the time we finished dinner, it was too late for most of the shows and main stage entertainment, so we closed up Skywalkers, walked the outer decks, and then called it a balmy night. We love the way this itinerary was structured, with sea days before, between, and after the paired port days, 
giving us a chance to rest up and enjoy the ship. Those fresh smoothies at the juice bar became part of our morning routine, and we also enjoyed more of the Explore Japan cultural gatherings, like Bonadori dance classes in Club Fusion and the origami lessons in the Savoy. The weather was perfect for our afternoon indulgence in the sanctuary, which can be booked for $20 for a half day and $40 for a full day, which gets you a cushioned lounger with a beautiful view and personalized service. Massages are extra. As we chilled with cappuccinos, lunch from the nearby Trident Grill was served, followed by afternoon tea. We would work some of that off with a few laps around that gorgeous promenade and then start the process all over again in Kai Sushi. <laughs> Kai Sushi is open for lunch and dinner and commands a $15 service charge for five courses or a la carte pricing for individual items. Currently it's available on the Diamond Princess and the new Sun Class ships. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. On each cruise, we enjoy squeezing in a few quizzes, and that night there was a silent quiz where one host mimes the clues while we run to the stage and whisper our answers to the other in a fun twist. The next morning, Diamond Princess called it Akita on the northwest coast of Honshu, Japan's main island. <laughs> And of course, Akita is where the Akita dogs come from, which is why our funny tour guide, Miwi, was wearing her unusual dog-eared cap. Like our prior guides, she too was well-informed, engaging, and funny, in a way that reminded me of comedian and flamenco guitar maestro Charo. And by the way, I love Charo. Our best of Akita tour began with a drive to the local foothills to the Kakuno Date Samurai District, which is little changed since its founding in 1620. We visited several samurai homes and even had a chance to don some imposing headgear. I had an encounter with an old world swallowtail butterfly before we headed off to our next stop, Lake Tazawa, which is Japan's deepest lake and known for its many shades of blue. After an excellent and authentic Japanese lunch, we returned to the ship just as she was preparing to sail off into another beautiful sunset. There were two more sold out shows for Kite that night, the second of which we enjoyed very much. Our final port of call was Aomori, which is at the northern tip of Honshu, Japan's main island. We took the full day best of Aomori excursion, which visited the Seruji Buddhist Temple, home to an impressive pagoda and Japan's largest daibutsu, or seated Buddha. <laughs> At our next stop, the Sanai Mariyama archaeological site, our excellent guide Fujita gave us a tour of the Jamon ruins, which date from 13,000 BC. After lunch, the tour continued to Mount Hakoda and a scenic tram ride up its 4,000-foot summit. I hated to miss that, but I took a detour to visit the 1964-built ferry named after the mountain, the preserved museum ship Hakoda Maru which originally operated between Aomori and Hokkaido, Japan's northernmost main island. On my way back to the Diamond Princess, I rode the panoramic elevator to the top of the A-shaped Aomori Prefectural Building for a 400 yen or $2.50 view. Keen Godzilla fans might recognize the Aomori Bay Bridge, which was destroyed by Mothra in one of the recent franchises. We enjoyed another beautiful departure, then headed to Sabatini's for an encore dinner overlooking the Deck 7 promenade. Princess's legendary Italian eatery commands a $35 cover 
which is worth it just for the breads and olive oil alone. Every meal begins with arancini and marinara sauce, and the pastas are made from scratch. I enjoyed a perfect chicken scallopini, while Mike opted for the grilled filet mignon. No pepper. For dessert, there is a rocher sealed in milk chocolate and a dizzying tiramisu. Bravo was the big show in the theater, and there was a fun cruise show in Explorer's Lounge. By the time we called it a night, Diamond Princess was enveloped in an eerie fog on her southbound course. Maybe because it portended the end of our cruise, the final sea day seemed a bit gloomy. Oh man, thank you so much. That looks great. Nonetheless, we perked things up at good spirits with iced matchas and a cappuccino or two, enjoying the soothing sounds of Simon and Olga wafting through the Grand Plaza. It's not as though we needed more caffeine or sweets, but we wanted to experience the afternoon tea in the international dining room. No. We would also work out, pack, and attend a quiz or two, but these streets are more fun to look at. <laughs> Cruise directors Fernando and Mikiko hosted a pair of sold out variety shows in the theater, giving us one more chance to experience Kate's violin virtuosity. On our way back to the cabin, we stopped by the Grand Plaza for some more farewell festivities. As we slept, Diamond Princess made an early morning arrival in Yokohama, where we would disembark. We already miss this wonderful ship in Japan, which we hope to visit again soon. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed this and haven't already, please subscribe. And if you're a Princess fan, you might want to check out our Princess playlist for more videos.